how it's possible to create this kind of, of community and this kind of culture and how you can succeed. One of the things that we do uh, as part of the Sustainability Institute, and their website is institutesustainability.com, is we write white papers that sort of complement some of this thinking. Um, and you know, we've done white papers about the definition of sustainability for business. We have done white papers about the business case. Um, and and uh, uh, it is obviously critical that these things make business sense. People aren't going to do these things if they help put you out of business. So we actually talk about uh, what, from an objective analytical perspective, what these types of practices do to the performance of businesses. And the good news is that uh, you know companies that are more sustainable tend to perform significantly better than companies that are not. Uh, A.T. Kearney did a study looking specifically at 100 companies in 19 industries uh, and to try to understand what happens in a, in, a, in a bad economic recessionary climate to companies that are focused on sustainability. And their conclusion was that these companies added $650 million more value to them than companies that were not focused on sustainability. Last year, um, if you look at the sale of green household and personal care products, while the average household and personal care product was flat, uh, you know, there was no increase in sales, and there's some exceptions. Diapers actually were down 9% in uh, 2009 in unit sales. Does that, anybody know why diaper sales were down last year? Yes. 9%. They were down 9% because um, lower income people change diapers less frequently. And they used less diapers. Um, and, uh, 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 you know, those are some of the hidden effects of this economy that, that most people don't look at. When you're looking at things like diaper sales, you see these kinds of things. Uh, but anyway, um, sales of green products, and often these are more expensive products, were actually up anywhere from 40% in some categories to 80 to 100%. That, that, that one of the transformative things in this whole green products uh, industry is that as people begin to understand that green products are not just about the environment, but they're actually about your health, and that, that you know, people would say, well, you know, why should I spend 25 cents more on this spray cleaner that doesn't have toxins or chemicals? Well, you know, when you start to understand that that 25 cents might save you uh, from having your son get an asthma attack. And, you know, when you look at the copay of the asthma attack, taking a day off work to take your child to the, 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 the doctor, I mean, there's an overwhelming case often um, when you start to look at the health issues together with the environmental issues, why some of these products, if they're really green, uh, make a lot of sense. Um, five minutes. So, um, let me um, let me let me let me end um, with uh, what what I see uh, moving forward, and and uh, one of the reasons why I stay involved with Seventh Generation, aside from the fact that they pay me well and I enjoy doing it, is that I believe that we need uh, independent. Uh, you know, models of what is possible from the business community. Um, and one of the challenges, that, you know, the people that I grew up with, whether it's Ben Cohen or Anita Roddick or, or all of my peers 20 years ago, virtually all of them have sold their business to large CPG companies. And, and while that's good for some of them and they made a lot of money, I don't think it maintains the trajectory of innovation and, 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 and new uh, practices and structure that we need to build upon. And so um, we have fought hard to keep seventh generation independent. Um, it is not an easy thing to do. Uh, we don't take venture capital money. We don't take private equity. We really only take money from individuals and families 
um, which is hard when you get, get big because that's not the way the capital markets are designed. Um, so a big passion of mine is to build seventh generation sort of as a laboratory to prove that business can do all the things that many people in business say business can't do. Um, and I think we need those kinds of models. Uh, the reason that, that I am involved with and help create the Sustainability Institute is that I think that business needs to be educated, in many cases re-educated, um, and that uh, uh, it is really, really important uh, to help change not only the, the facts and figures and numbers that businesses understand, but really the way they think. And in many ways, the Sustainability Institute is about, you know, we, we talk about the kind of mindset you need to have to practice sustainability. And the, the third thing that I'm involved in, uh, the American Sustainable Business Council, is because I believe that we need to change policy. We need to change the tax code. We need to change regulations. We need to change incentives. And, and quite frankly, uh, that's a challenging endeavor. Uh, you know, my, my commitment is to try to figure out how to uh, institute full cost accounting while I still have the energy and, and mobility to be out there fighting for it. Um, but it, it has been amazing. I mean, this organization has been around for only six months. We have 40,000 business members in, in six months and it is growing just, I you know, incredibly because th there is a, a, a voice of business that just is not heard in the political landscape that we, we have today. And so I, I wanna, wanna build that uh, to rival the influence of the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, and you know, I had an interesting meeting. Yesterday I met with the New York Manhattan Chamber of Commerce and I was trying to convince them to join the, uh, the American Sustainable Business Council um, because I thought it would just be wonderfully symbolic if we could start getting the chambers to reaffiliate with this new group. And, and, and I'm not sure they're gonna give up their affiliation with the National Chamber, but they might also join the American Sustainable Business Council because they know that the message, the information, and the policies that we are advocating are good for their members. And their uh, point of view is not represented at the national level. So uh, I hope I haven't depressed you all. Um, um, and uh, I, I look forward to, uh, with some of the other panelists answering questions. Um, please, if you have a question for me, uh, uh, I always say to the audience, you know, there's no question I've ever been asked that I have refused to answer. That's part of the way I practice my own transparency, and I would love to be proved wrong. I'd love to, to hear that question that I won't answer. Uh, so uh, please don't hold back in uh, asking me uh, anything. Anyway, thank you very much. So everyone's going to come. Oh, okay. Uh, yes? Is There's that only one there. Yeah. So it's for me. I'm sorry. Stay here. here. Okay. Uh, we'll continue with a panel member, George Brill. Uh, I met George yesterday and was amazed with his knowledge of world politics and the involvements that he had made. Uh, he brings a lot of um, expertise in co consulting area. He was working with uh, developing countries, mostly with their governments for about 30 years, heading a company, heading his consultancy firm called ARD Incorporated. Um, and this morning he actually mentioned that he was in academia before and he also worked in a nonprofit research firm uh, working on the sustainability metrics before he founded his consulting, consulting agency. So with that, I will just welcome George Brill to the 